Hey, welcome back to The Luxury Code, where we unpack what it took to become the agent that this person is so you can R&D, rip off and duplicate, and absolutely do the same. So today, I've got longtime buddy, Jay Glazer, 13 years in New York City as a real estate professional, born and raised in Manhattan, which is unique in and of itself because we meet so many people that move there to go sell real estate. Uh, last year, $87 million in volume. Remember, New York City 2021. That was a monster number, and he probably did most of that in the, I'd guess, three quarters of the year, uh, with about $2 million in commissions. So far this year, $105 million in volume as we sit here, I think, August 2nd or 3rd. And it's just Jay and four rock star teammates doing it all. So, Jay, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's always good to see you. Uh, am I going to see you in a couple weeks? Confession, I will not be there. I, okay, interview is over. Shut the whole thing down. No, I'm just busting your chops, buddy. We, for the Sorry, record, we, I, you know, I have to go, but um, I, have a, I have a young daughter and I have to pick my spots these days with the travel. Smart man, so. smart man. Happy wife, happy life. I get it. So, right. so Jay, I will miss you, but as always, you know, I get to connect with you here and then get to introduce you to so many people that are listening and watching this show. So, you know, you've done a really remarkable job creating a brand in your marketplace. Right. And, and I think right. you and I both can appreciate, you know, a brand is different to the person that ultimately gets attracted to it. I've watched you create a lot of content. I've watched you do a lot of different things to build up your successful career. Sure. Today, I want to talk about the stuff that really worked to help you elevate and become the luxury broker that you are. So, so right. why don't we just start from the very beginning? Um, when you first got started in real estate 13 years ago, what mm -hmm. did you do and how does that contrast differently to the things you know work today? Kind of a big question, but take me from the beginning to today. Sure. So I would say the thing that I immediately did without any real guidance or suggestions from anybody, um, actually one of the things I always, I always joked about was if I had like discovered your page in the beginning part of my career, I would have had better guidance on what to do and a blueprint on how to build my business. But I, I clung on to senior agents or more successful agents in the beginning of my career yeah. um, because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, you can't know what you're doing. You know, you you, um, you you fake it till you make it, right? So in that case, I I just partnered with as many agents in the office I was working in. I did fall into a bit of luck, which is I worked in a mostly sales-based office. A lot of agents in New York City work the ranks of rentals and then they sort of get their small sales and then they get their luxury sales. So I was really able to get my foot in the door with sales very early in my career. And then I just, you know, are indeed those agents. I, I specifically identified what I liked about what they were doing and then eliminated what I didn't like what they were doing and, and basically built my own business model, my own way of doing business, I should say, based on, on what I was seeing from other agents. So, so Jay, my question for you is, do you, do you now allow, other newer agents to do the same thing with you? And do you advise others that want to break into luxury, even if they're already experienced agent to do the same? Yeah. Yeah. Always. I think you got to give what you get and get what you give. Um, first for sure. Um, I always, I find that I bring on newer agents to my team. Um, and one of the things that I really pride myself on with our team is, is really pushing them to become the best version of themselves. You hear a lot of stories about agents who just want, and you've used this term a lot, like minions on the team, and they don't actually want to grow and develop agents. Yeah. I actually get more stressed out and frustrated when my agents don't develop because I just want them to be the best version of whatever professional they can be. So yeah, I mean, I was with a, I went on a listing presentation last week with an agent who's not been in the business as long as I have. She knew that this wasn't her her, her sector wasn't really her specialty. And she brought me in to basically meet the owner with her because she wanted that guidance and expertise. And I'm all about that. I've always, always felt probably from your ecosystem that there's always plenty to go to plenty to go around for everybody. So there's yeah. nothing to really hide from anybody. I agree. So what, what would you say though, to the person that maybe is listening to this and their sales price is X, but they know if they just right. drove 10 minutes to the left or 10 minutes to the right or whatever it may be, they could elevate their sales price. But, should they go mentor somebody? What is that? What does that person need to do to go into the high end? Do they just mentor somebody or let's talk maybe some marketing tactics? What would you recommend? Yeah. I mean, as far as marketing tactics go, I think you have to put yourself in the mindset of where the ultra wealthy 
i.e. the people who can afford to buy and sell those types of properties in your marketplace, you have to put yourself in, in, in the places they would be or in the events or the type of activities that they would do. So as you know, I love golf and it's yeah. very organic for me. As bad as I am, I still love it and I enjoy it. And golf, it so happens to be, you know, fairly luxurious and, you know, attracts a certain crowd. And I meet a lot of clients on the golf course mm -hmm. and it's very organic and it's very natural. So I'm in an, I'm in an environment where I can entertain clients or, or meet new clients or entertain clients of clients, whatever the situation may be. So if you're trying to get into a luxury segment, I find a lot of agents especially with social media, they sort of, they, they force it. They kind of pretend they're living a life that they're not actually living. Go find something that you actually enjoy and then find the community of that, of that activity or that pleasure where people who have, you know, the ability to buy and sell expensive real estate and luxury real estate, um, hang out. So if say, if you're, if you love chess, I'm sure there's a chess community that draws, you know, affluent people. I but agree. if you don't like chess, don't go play chess, period. Yeah. I, th I think there's something to it. You know, a lot of people, you know, myself included, we've made that cliche statement of fake it till you make it. I just right. don't think you can fake this. I, I don't think taking a photo in front of, you know, a private jet no that way. you're not leasing or chartering that day, uh, you know, just right. to show that you're like, I think that, that to me is just phony baloney. I love the advice of find what you're passionate about and go, go attract people that are in that. Like I actually was talking to a client. She plays pickleball in Scottsdale, Arizona, Perfect. Scottsdale, Arizona, where she is is a higher end marketplace, right? Perfect. And she's playing pickleball with all these guys and gals. And you know what they buy one and two and five and $10 million houses. Right. So there is I, something to that. I think that's perfect. I mean, I was just I was just saying to my wife that we should play pickleball funny enough. Um, but no, I agree with that. I also think that there's ways you could do it on the cheap. Like golf yeah. is obviously expensive. I don't know yes. much about pickleball. It doesn't seem expensive, but it might be hard to find places to play. Skiing is expensive. Horseback riding is expensive. Right. Going to sit at a nice bar in New York City, because probably you're going to be drinking anyway if you're a real estate agent. You might as well just go sit at a bar and you're going to and you're going to meet you're going to meet people at the bar. I actually worked for a guy who goes to Aspen and St. Bart's, which are obviously yeah. luxury areas, and he just sits at the bar and he has met millionaire after millionaire yes. engaging with people at the bar. Yeah. That's not really that expensive to do in, in any marketplace. Christoph Chu would talk about that all the time in Beverly Hills. Just go be where the people with money are, right? And, and be friendly, be conversational. Right. And the funny thing is, I think everyone listening, you know this, everybody wants to talk about the real estate market. Everybody right. wants to know what's happening with home prices, what's going to go on next. Are we in a bubble? Is the news media correct? I keep seeing home prices go up. My friend right. just, you know, like everybody wants to talk about it. Okay, so so I'm going to go a totally different direction for a second. I typically wait for the end, but I think there's going to be some 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 fun stuff for us to unpack in this. So I've been playing a game with my clients called What's Hot, What's Not. I'm just going to ask you flat out, Jay, this, hot or not, you tell me. You okay. ready? Okay. So first yeah. thing. Jay, hot or not, studying the market? Hot. Super hot. FISBO previews oh, as a listing agent? Hot. Yeah, that looked like mild. Okay, I'll take it as mild. Street easy? Unfortunately hot. Yes, unfortunately hot. Okay, I'll take that. Calling your past clients? Hot, and I need to do more of it. Hot, and I need to do more of it. Green suits? Not hot for me anymore. Not hot for you anymore, but anybody knows, Jay, there was a green suit moment. Okay, Bayonne oh, Golf Course. It's hot is hot. Hot is hot. Okay, okay, but let's get some tactics. Short form video. Hot. Hot. Okay, long form video. Not hot. Not hot. Okay, advertising on Google. For us, not hot. Okay, not hot. Email marketing. Always hot. Always hot. Direct mail. Lukewarm. Lukewarm. Open houses. Always hot. Calling, calling on building owners and calling on potential sellers. Not hot. Love it. Okay. I think I missed only, no, I got every one of them. So, okay. Then I want to go back to my very first question. I said, you started 13 years ago. You had the unfair advantage of being born and raised in the city, 
right? For sure. You know, great parents, you know, like great situation growing up, get into real estate. You talked about how you got started. Talk to us about what your business looks like today. What are the buckets of where your business comes from and how do you get it? Sure. So it's funny because I think at least by, by just listening and observation, people have this assumption of me in New York City as having this ridiculous network. And I'm probably my own biggest, um, you know, criticizer, critic of never actually having utilized that network, you know, being not, not nearly as social and connecting with people I went to high school with, you know, in New York City, et cetera, and not utilizing that, that database that I, that I do have. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, in some ways I've under, uh, achieved in that department. So for me, I've, my pillars of business have always been, and I've just like drilled this since day one has just been exceptional customer service. And with exceptional customer service, I've been able to really be aggressive with referral business from past clients and current clients. You know, there, there was a time where I think you even said at an event or someone said, you know, make sure you get two or three referrals from this client or a, a client. Right. And I actually sent text messages to certain clients and said, by the end of this calendar year, I expect three referrals from you no matter what. And that level of confidence, it's not arrogance. It comes from the fact that I know that I'm providing such a quality product to my clients yes. that I know that whoever they refer me to is going to get service that they're not going to get anywhere else. And as a result, I feel very confident you know, basically making that request to my people. So I wanted, I wanted like someone probably heard that Jay and they were like, Oh my God, I could never just text that to my clients. Right. Safe to say you got an extraordinary level of rapport with a person before you send that text. That's not like, Hey, we just closed a transaction and you're going to send me three referrals. For sure. It's someone you know is going to be a lifelong client and then right. you've built a real relationship with. Right. No question. Right. There are, listen, I'm not going to lie. There are clients I would be mortified asking that of. But the majority yes. of them, yes. I feel very confident in asking that. So if I hear you correctly, it started out with you probably underutilized your personal database. For and there's sure. something yeah, interesting sure. to unpack there. And then you said it's really just providing exceptional customers. Now, I know there's more. But I want to impact, how do you define exceptional customer service? So it's funny you should, you should ask that. I've actually been looking at homes in other markets for myself, a second home, in second home markets. Mm -hmm. And I've really been studying how agents engage with me uh, as a customer and thinking, okay, well, we do this very differently on my team. We do that kind of similar. So I think exceptional customer service comes from one, a relentless desire for the, the outcome the client wants, right? So what that means is you really put the, I mean, I know it's cliche, but it's true. You put the client above all else, right? Yeah. The client's needs above all else. And then listening. I mean, listening is shockingly hard to do for real estate agents, I find. We're really internalizing what the client is telling you and then taking that information and repurposing it with an intent to sell them something or sell something for them with, with, a, with a high level of, of achievement and success. So listening. And then I also think it's, it's simply just attention to detail on all the tiny little steps along the way in the process of selling a home or selling a client a home. You know, there is no silver bullet or secret sauce to being a really great real estate agent. I think a lot of people try to sell that, you know, that witchcraft, both yeah. to clients and just in our ecosystem. But when I meet with a seller or a buyer, I say, the 100 steps A through Z along the way, we're just going to execute them all. My team and myself, my team especially, amazing support. We're going to execute them with as much attention, detail, and care as we possibly can. Because I think, you know, you could you could have an amazing dining experience, and then the waiter takes an extra five minutes to drop the check at the restaurant, and all of a sudden that experience goes to crap, yeah. no matter how great the meal was. Yeah. So we're very mindful of that scenario with our clients of. A through Z, from the intake to the time we shake their hand at the closing table, we really want them to feel like they're having an excellent experience. And by doing that, you can then lean on them to return the favor by introducing you to people. And that's basically been the foundation of business. I mean, that's been about 65% of our business through the years. Yeah. And that's a lot, right? Especially at, you know, you're looking at, you know, call it $150, $170 million in volume this year, 75, 80 transactions, I'm guessing. 
Yeah, I mean, we're at we're at 51 now, so we'll be at probably 70. Yeah, congrats. So, Thanks. so do you have an SOP or a checklist? Like, it it's easy for someone to hear it. You and I both know. Like, think think back to when we met in like 2015. You know, did right. you have checklists? Did you have systems? Did you have processes? Or were you doing a lot of things by memory? There's a good chance that someone listening right now, Jay, is still doing it by memory. Yeah, I mean, is, we've. I mean, to be perfectly honest, so much of the systems and processes that we have in place are, you know, it's it. You there's a lot of um, we do a lot of role playing in our business, right? So yeah. I've just internalized so much of it, right? I mean, I could sit down and do a buyer's meeting in my sleep. I could probably yes. roll out of bed and do and give it to somebody, and they would never know that I just woke up. So mm-hmm. that that I think is just repetition, repetition, repetition. Right. But yeah, I mean, I have one of the things I've worked on through the years with through your ecosystem is building a team. I hate being organized. Like I hate spreadsheets. I, I'm an inbox zero guy. You will never see a red dot on my iPhone, but I also don't love the systems and processes part of the business. So I've, I've hired people to handle that for us. That was one of the first things that getting into coaching really pushed me towards was, you know, if you don't want to do the work, hire someone to do it for you. You know, you always used to say, if, if, you know, if you don't have an assistant, you are the assistant. Right. So, you know, I got smart quick and hired people who are very good at making sure that we have systems and processes in place. Steve Cohen, who I know is a friend of yours and a friend of mine, yeah. said the same. He's like, he's like, I know I have systems, Tom. I just don't know what they are. He's like, but <laughs> I know. Steve and I are very similar in the way yes. we operate. Yes. And Mala Sanders, right, from the Hamptons. Similar, similar yeah. conversation. She's like, I'm not yeah. super organized, but I'm really good with people. So, yeah. For the, for the person listening right now, let's unpack this just for a second. For the person listening that's like, oh, like I provide amazing service. And the way I do that is I do everything along the way for the client, for the transaction. Yep. What, do you, what do you say to that person? And that person's struggling or that person, what? They just, it's the, it's the most consistent argument I, I hear, which is, but I do everything for my client, so I don't need to hire anybody else. Now, I Got have it. my own argument, Jay, and I'll, I'll tell you mine is I know you have an 11-month-old baby, and right. I know you want to be home more, and you want to be around your kid sure. more. And I know what it was like to build my business early on and how much time it took and the sacrifices I had to make. And when people say, what would you have done differently? I say, I would have hired more people sooner. Yeah. I would have Got traded it. shekels for time for my young boys. Right. You with me? Yeah. I would have traded yeah. checkers for time. That, yeah. So what do you say to that person? I think that person is also probably not aware of the fact that they're probably losing droves and droves of business to the small teams like ours. Because yeah. what I always say to a client is, listen, I'm a, like, like Mala, I'm a people person. Do you want me articulating right. the details of why this home should transact, why this home should sell to the customers who are coming through the door? Or do you want me sitting there worrying about scheduling those people to even get there? Yeah. Right? Which part of the process do you want me to take control of? And the agent who does all that themselves is clearly going to be sacrificing something within their business. And then as you clearly pointed out, sacrificing in their personal life as well, they're going to be giving up. Listen, in my 20s, it's crazy to say that because I'm, you know, I'm still 37, but I've been doing this for a long time. In my 20s, I, I basically gained a ton of weight. You know, when I met you, I was 25 pounds heavier, give right. or take, and I had no social life, and I was doing all of this work on my own. And listen, business was booming. I was building a great business for myself, but I was sacrificing, you know, some of the other major pillars of my life, for right. sure. Right. It's so interesting because I, you know, obviously, you know, I'm a huge advocate for teams and I think people miss sometimes the point. The point is I want you to have it all. For I sure. Don't want, I don't want you to be obsessed about work and then miss health and vitality, miss your relationships, miss time with your kids. And if you don't have kids, time with your dog to go for a walk and not, you know what I mean? Like I want people, and that's why I say you need to leverage, but you know, it, things get misconstrued. I, I listen, I agree with that. I also think that. Listen, I get also for the agents who are trying to level up, it's it's scary to think, okay, I have to come out of pocket 50, 60K to get an assistant. Right. I get that fear, but that limiting factor and that limiting belief is probably the reason you're also not leveling up without the assistant. Yeah. But you true, gotta, true. you know, you gotta take the plunge. True, true. Okay. The market has clearly shifted. Everybody's felt it everywhere, right? Rome to, you know, to you name it. My question right. for you is 
what have you done differently on your listing presentations? What, what is hot for sellers now? What is no longer hot? How are you getting them to understand? Yes, your buddy sold their apartment a year ago and got, you know, this many offers in that price. And today, you know, maybe it's happening, maybe it's not. So what have you shifted in your presentation? Yeah, so it's a great question. And listen, it's an ongoing answer. Um, right. Because honestly, last week, interest rates went down a bit. And all of a sudden, there was consumer confidence for like an hour in New York City. And you right. tried to ride that short wave. So yep. it is, it's not a firm answer. I think, I think what happens in a shifting market is the way I articulate to my clients is it's not so much that you see an immediate drop or change in prices or something so dramatic as, as that. But what you see is a shift in the psychology of the consumer and a disconnect right. between what sellers expect and what buyers expect. And so I say to sellers, that disconnect is worth, is worth a certain financial amount, right? It's worth two, three percent, five percent on the price. So I have a, I have a friend, he, he has a tenant in his apartment and he's, he's trying to sell the tenant, the apartment. I'm, you know, I'm still helping him through the process. And he said, well, what if the tenant doesn't buy it? Should we list it at the same number we were going to list it at three, four months ago? And I said, yes, but your expectation of what that Delta between list and close was, was should adjust, not because the prices have dramatically shifted, but the expectations have shifted. And so if all of a sudden an offer is 8% below ask as opposed to 2% below ask, rather than being that seller, and we all have them, who get so deeply offended because it's such a low offer, as long as I can set that expectation early, when that offer comes in, then you can actually bridge the gap because you've planted the seed. Right. So well, those are the conversations I've had. It, it's so interesting. I mean, everyone I'm chatting with today is talking about buyers seem to understand the change in the market like that sellers 120 180 days because sure. they're still thinking about the cocktail party my friend sold couldn't believe it this many offers 100. they asked for a crazy price they got more and and in many cases that's just not the case anymore we're still in a great market it's just not that white hot insanity market so how do but you let me yeah go ahead let me jump in though, and this is not necessarily, this is a, not a luxury price point for our market, but it might yes. be for some of the listeners. We, sure. we took on a property, it was actually, you know, you asked the hot or not, we, we got a, a basically a come list me call from a postcard. Yes. And we list it, this guy, we sit down with him, it's, it's an apartment that needs a substantial amount of work. And he said, I'd like to get one one for my apartment. I said, listen, one one is probably a fair number to want, but it's not factoring in, in factoring in interest rates and a shifting buyer expectation. So why don't we list it at nine ninety nine? Because obviously that's a massive cliff for a lot of people. And I will make sure I get you multiple offers, and we're in contract for one point two. Okay, I want that to be the clip on Instagram because that was beautiful, right? Say that again. Say the opening line again because the opening line was perfect. They said, I want to get, I want to get one, one. And, and right. you're like, so let met, me explain. Right. Yeah. You're right. So I met a seller who said, ideally I'd like to get one, one. That's honestly where it comped out. But as you mm -hmm. pointed out, comps are sort of irrelevant three to six months ago at this right. point. Right. Right. So we priced it. I said, let's put it at nine ninety nine, and I, and I will ensure that we get multiple offers. Lo and behold, the floodgates open and we're, we're in contract for 1.2. So yeah. we're now a hundred K over the number that he was hoping to get for his apartment. Yeah. The key well, that I, the yeah. What yeah. I love though, Jay, is you said something to the effect of that's a great price to want because of interest rates and buyer expectations. I'm right. going to recommend 999. Like that line for me, I was like, I wish I captured it, it and I got it in my head. Sorry. I'll say it. So yes. Yeah. So that's, I no, but no. It. Yeah. We don't need to rehash. I think the, the listener is like, yeah. Cause that was like, oh, that was a really strong line. That's a, it's, it's great that you want that. And we need to now factor in changing market, interest rates higher, da, 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 da. So it's beautiful. So well, you mentioned earlier that you guys role play. We, we don't, we don't, I, we, sh we should do more role play. It's more that <laughs> I have done so much of what I'm doing in my business that yeah. it basically is just, you know, you should not do this if you're listening, but I live role play with clients at this point because of this, you know, it's so, it's so yeah. ingrained into my system at this point. Yes. Yes. But, but that's because of years of practice and practice and practice and Tons practice. practice. So yes. Yeah. 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 I love it. Okay. So Jay, as we wrap this up, first of all, this has been super fun. I miss you. Uh, I want to come play Bayonne right away as soon as I can. Uh, I'm actually going to be on the East coast right. soon. So separate, separate side note for all my clients in New York city, talking about doing something in the fall heads up, but we'll have to be before or after Jay and I play golf. All right. So 
closing thoughts, most important advice you've ever given or received about becoming a great luxury broker, what was it? You have to believe that you belong in that marketplace. You know, we all have limiting beliefs. We all have self image issues. If you know, maybe that's not the right word, but we all lack confidence sometimes. And you know, the notion that I've always wanted to break into higher price points. So everybody does, right? Yeah. When I went on my first listing presentation for a $15 million apartment, I was nervous as it can be, as can be. I mean, my, you know, I was shaking in the elevator up to the apartment, mm -hmm. but I believe that's where I belong. And that that's the type of advice I was given in order to walk in there with, you know, the confidence, because, because as we, as we, as you know, a lot of your, a lot of your communication is nonverbal. And if you walk in there, you know, and you are, you know, cowering, then they're going to know that you don't belong there. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Good advice. All right. Kiss that gorgeous baby. I can't wait to see you soon. I'm going to miss sure. you at the summit, but you're there in spirit always. Thank you so much. And for the person listening, uh, make sure you follow. It's Jay Glazer NYC on Instagram. I follow him. He is hysterical and funny and interesting and thought provoking. So make sure you check him out there. And then Jay, thank you just for your generosity and sharing for everybody out there. Make sure you like subscribe and do all that, you know, fun stuff for, you know, Instagram and YouTube. And we'll see you guys on the next show. Jay, thanks so much, partner. Thank you.